My name is Carmi Palafox, an urban planner and economist. Welcome to Beyond Places, the podcast about the planning, design, and leadership of the communities and cities that we call home. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Beyond Places. Our guest is a leader in city planning and design with multiple years of experience in making and implementing plans for fast-growing regions, emerging cities, and revitalized urban districts in Asia and other parts of the world. He has led multidisciplinary teams and engaged decision makers in real estate and government to provide market responsive, context sensitive, and implementation ready urban solutions. He is a co founder and CEO of N City, an international urban and regional planning, design, and research studio focusing on solving urban problems and transforming places. The multi-awarded practice has offices in Singapore, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Our guest is also a lecturer in urban planning at the National University of Singapore. Welcome, Zhong Do Muyin. Thanks, thanks, Kami, for having me today here. It's, it's great to talk to you about a lot of different topics. Thank you as well. And it's nice to see you, Zhong. It's, it's been a few years since we last met. Yes, and, and COVID will make the time no feel like much longer. That's true. That's yeah. true. Well, you've been busy since I last saw you. So you have founded your company, End City. Uh, if you would like to tell us more about it, please. Yes, I, I think that um, I have been uh, practicing of employing in more than 10 different countries in Asia. And one thing I realized when I work in many different projects in different contexts is that um, now um, many, most of the consultants tend to copy and paste, especially on the model from the Western world. And even the textbook in urban planning programs are mostly written uh, for the uh, Western context as well, right? So, um, and that's why that's really driving me to uh, establish and city as we hope that with our very long commitment in Asian urbanism and our know-how, our experience here, and also our insight from build project, right? And a lot of research as well, we can really help to set place that is not just even sustainable, competitive, but also really speak for the lifestyle, for the soul and the culture of Asian people. And that's the reason why we have NCT. And because that reason, we call ourselves actually urban solution provider, because we don't want to, we believe that to solve urban problem, we should not just depend on blueprints. We can think of policy, we can think of design planning, but we also can think of technology. And NCT is really focused on the cities, and, but very open into what kind of solution we can provide. And your practice is, is quite active, as you say, around Asia. But I wanted to congratulate you as well, because very recently you made an announcement that you and City and your partners, you won the planning competition for the master plan of Ho Chi Minh City. Thanks. Yes, it, it, they just announced it. It's really exciting news for us. And City together with uh, two other institutes, VIUP is the National Planning Institute, and UPI, which is Ho Chi Minh City Planning Institute, we worked uh, together to propose a plan that we hope will transform uh, Ho Chi Minh City for the next 30 years. We look forward to continue collaboration with the cities and the stakeholders here to help implement some of the ideas we have during the competition. For our international audience who may have not visited Ho Chi Minh or Vietnam, can you tell us some things about Ho Chi Minh? Yes, definitely. Now, I'm not from Ho Chi Minh City myself, but this city that I've been studying for many years is, is a city that is along Saigon River and also quite close to Dong Nai River, which is one of the biggest river delta in Vietnam. And it's between a very a more of the high ground mountainous area to the north and the Mekong Delta to the south. And it's, Ho Chi Minh City now is the biggest city in Vietnam with a population um, officially is 9 million. But people mm-hmm. believe that it can be even go up to 12 million if we also count for the transient population, commuters, daily commuters in the region. And it definitely also an uh, economic hub of, this, of Vietnam, producing about 30% of the GDP. So uh, it, it's quite similar to the role of Bangkok in Thailand in terms of 
uh, economic uh, powerhouse. And I think what unique about Ho Chi Minh City is a city that have many different influence throughout the entire history. Uh, it's, it's, it started with actually is Chinese migrants from South China to Vietnam and how established some of the, the sport hub to export the rice from Mekong Delta to the world. And then Vietnamese people, some of the indigenous people as well. And then the friends came and start to do some of the very first layout for the cities and definitely the American influence before 1975 also very critical. And then after that is, especially during after, after 1986, when Vietnam reopened the economy to the world, Ho Chi Minh is a driving force for, for the country as the country now navigate themselves uh, in a much wide and open market. It's a very exciting time, it seems, yeah. for not just Ho Chi Minh, but for Vietnam. And I mean, from what I've read, because obviously we haven't been able to travel so much, although I know you've been traveling a lot between Singapore and, and Vietnam. Too. But I heard that Ho Chi Minh did quite well in the height of the pandemic in terms of somehow containing the effects of it. So I think for that and a few other reasons, foreign investors are really looking at Ho Chi Minh and Vietnam more. Yeah, actually the fact that Vietnam did quite well in the until last summer, we, we controlled the COVID and life is going normally in the country. But then, you know, Delta variant hit Ho Chi Minh City actually last summer. I just left the city and, and I think a few days later, they had to shut down the city for another four months. And about 3,000 people died in Ho Chi Minh mm-hmm. City. So, so it, 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 they did well before, but after that, they do also experience the structure that many other cities and country in the region experience as well. But we all clap that they bounce back quickly. The Vietnam and Ho Chi City opened their door uh, this early this year, and now everything's back to normal. And uh, I think that that also helped to reconfirm the confidence of the people, especially investor in the country and in the city. And it's a strong sign of strong leadership, I guess. I, I would say that it, it, it meet the uh, two things. And one is the, what they call it is a collective leadership. So it may, it's not one man, but it's a team of people that help to navigate the cities throughout the pandemic, include the invo- their involvement directly from the prime minister as well, right? Mm-hmm. But, but they do see that somehow the team not only work well, and they even have to do some resuffering, right? Resuffering during that, that, that campaign to contain the pandemic, uh, and, and changing, actually, they, they, they replace the mayor of the city. So that one side, but another side is the story of people. We mm-hmm. was amazed how resilient the Ho Chi Minh City people were during the pandemic. You know, it's, it's not easy to shut down a city of 10 million people in four months, right? And sometimes it's happened like what you see today in Shanghai, for example, there's not enough food supply. And a lot of people, they run out of their money to pay for just essential uh, living condition, like their rent, their food, or sending the kid to school. But you see that when, when uh, in the difficult time, people help each other, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think and that helped the city survive as a, as a big community, as a big family. With this master plan, with what you just said about, you know, the strong maybe cooperation among people and leadership, Will the stakeholders and the local community be very much involved in this 2040 master plan of the city? Yes. Now, what we did with the, the city for the competition is a competition. So definitely we have about just two or three months to work on it. And we didn't have um, any chance to engage the stakeholders. But uh, when I was at the same time, because we involved in the city master plan. And the city is part of Ho Chi Minh City. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like pulled up in Shanghai, so which is which is making up a very big piece of land in the city and also an important economic hub in Ho Chi Minh City as well. We run many workshops with different stakeholders and communities from scholars, uh, investors, government officers, right? And also we create a website that even very easy for people to come and even share their opinions. And even try to do some drawing or add their input on the map. 
where they want things to happen, right? Together with our partner Sasaki, we will be able to launch that website. I think also uh, last summer uh, for two. So the short answer is we didn't do any stable engagement for Ho Chi Minh City at that scale. But for two, the city, we did many different workshops and mm -hmm. campaigns and using website to engage people. We'll go back to the city master plan yes. um, in a bit. But I wanted to talk about, as you mentioned it, the Ho Chi Minh City Innovation District. That's right. So it's about 200, 211 square kilometers or 21,000 hectares. Uh, very exciting. So if you can please tell us more about why it's being called an innovation district. Yes. I, I think that one of the main uh, challenges for Ho Chi Minh City is how to improve its competitiveness, mm -hmm. right? When, it, when they compare Ho Chi Minh City with other major cities in the region like Manila, Jakarta, Bangkok. We actually still not there that yet in terms of economic powerhouse and also as a regional hub, right? Uh, because we, I think we, we start later compared to other cities. Mm -hmm. And also Vietnam have a quite a, a, a huge potential to grow the economy given the digital economy, right? the internet economy because of young population and also very technology savvy, right? Actually, Vietnam is a top 10 electronics exporter in the world, right? And, and also now it's a lot of startup is one of the, I think the, one of the third largest, the third largest ecosystem for startup in Southeast Asia, right? I didn't know so that. We, have, we have quite a lot of potential. So the, the previous, the party chief, so the Communist Party of Ho Chi Minh City, Mr. Dr. Nguyen Thiet Nhân, he really imagined that he want to capture scientist opportunity of industry 4.0, right? Mm -hmm. And a, a young and talented IT sector workforce to transform Ho Chi Minh City in, into a smart city, innovative city. But of course, doing at the scale Ho Chi Minh City is not that easy. So they want to start it with a, a smaller part of Ho Chi Minh City, which is Thu Duc City. Mm -hmm. So he, he merged three different districts, District 2, District Nai and district and to the district together to form a new city with 1.1 million people and occupy a land of 21,000 hectares. And the reason is first, it's really already a, a hub for a lot of tech firms, right? Ho Chi Minh City High Tech Park is there with Intel and Samsung and a lot of other local tech firms already there producing 17 billion US dollars of product every year. The National University of Ho Chi Minh City is also there with, I, mean, I think, 100,000 students already there, right? And so many other cluster with IT firm, design firm, creative firms, and also have a lot of uh, good infrastructure. And it sit in the location that you can say really the heart of the entire Southeast region of Vietnam and sit between the CBD of Ho Chi Minh City today, District 1, and the future Long Tang International Airport. So mm -hmm. such a strategic location with all existing ecosystem for innovation. And that's why he set a vision that it become a new city. So it have more autonomous situation status in decision making and turn that into an innovation district. Actually the full name was highly interactive and innovative district of Ho Chi Minh City. So that's the story behind it. And you were quoted to say a good governance system will transform technology and smart solutions into social benefit. Can you please tell us what you mean by this? I, I think that the smart city is has been driven by tech companies. And in many cases, they are selling devices, equipments to the government, right? Or developing solutions for the sake of technology in sector, right? And why it, it, they may provide you with some fancy devices, very many the time people are asking what the benefit to the pupil, especially in the developing country like Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we think that it should be bottom up, not top down, by understanding what the need of the pupil. Well, if you ask any normal people in, in, in Tudok or Ho Chi Minh City, they will worry about things like, oh, flooding, traffic jam, right? air pollution, how to send the kids safely to school every day, right? So those are con uh, concerns and technology should be able to address those concerns, right? 
Mm-hmm. So I think that, so that's where we, we started our idea. So we've been working with the city, surveying the communities, also understanding the capacity of the local tech sector as well to see how it can match between what the people need mm-hmm. and what the sector can provide. And of course, using the government as a facilitator, right? The, the enabler of the whole system. So the Thudok City Master Plan, is it complete already? It's, it's still in, on progress. So we are still a lot of work to do. But I think the, there's some, the clear action is already there. You know, your, your statement about that reminded me of some conversations we've had in previous podcast episodes about smart cities. Yes. Because we've had some guests, namely, for example, Shirley Bendak, who's from Israel and the U.S. M- most recently. She was critical about how you hear about so many smart cities being yes. planned and developed around the world. But they sell it more from a you know technology and quote unquote yeah. innovation angle, but they forget about the the people. Yes. So with that, is how is the people being brought up, so to speak, with the development? There's two main aspects of the story. Number one is we need to understand what the people concern, what they mm-hmm. they need, right? Daily, right? I just mentioned traffic jam flooding issue, pollution, safety, right? So that's one thing that if we can serve those and help them to address those concerns, it's really will greatly benefit the larger community, right? But on, on the other side, I think the smart only benefit people when they being part of the process and, and they not just contribute data because everyone becomes the producer of data, but they even can using those data, right? and even can benefit commercially from those data or technology. Mm-hmm. I give you one example that I worked with IBM a few years back to develop like a smart city proposal for, for Singapore government. And so one of the idea that we can create a platform, I forgot the name, but it, it, it simplify coding. So, and that people can using that platform, which has become open source to even develop their own software, own apps, right? With, without a lot of in, uh, knowledge in IT mm-hmm. sector, right? So by that, so, so by provide tool like that to the communities, we hope that we can even encourage a lot more innovation for the, pe- at the people level, right? So mm-hmm. that's one thing. The second thing is data should be open, right? We talk a lot about the concern about privacy, right? And a lot of big techs, collect data and then using it for their commercial benefit. Why for the people, we become a product, right? So the idea now is how we can create a lot of open source platforms or open data so that people and firms can benefit from that. And Mm -hmm. using that for their own research, their own study, all coming up with their new kind of services, right? And the last one is how we can also create platform that connect communities so that they can work with each other, right? At, even at, at the neighborhood level. So government provide a platform, right? An app or the website where people can start to link in together. Like if, for example, as simple as I know how to do urban planning, I want to start a firm, but then I can find someone who really know about finance and marketing and can work together, right? So then with that, so that become a new virtual community that really help, really bring the benefit to the people. Right. So we, we, we did propose those kind of ideas. And I think if that being realized is really bring benefit uh, to the people, to the communities, not just the big corporations. So if we go back to the whole city master plan, you envisioned Ho Chi Minh as an open city. Why is that? No, I, I think that we all know that in this era of uh, technology and internet, uh, being open is both a strategies and the only choice to make the society beneficial from technology advancement, right? So that one aspect. I just mentioned to you, open source, open data, right? Mm-hmm. So that data being collected will, be, will benefit the communities, the people and startup and companies, right? Not just for the government or a few big uh, corporations, right? Open is about open for new ideas new possibilities, right? New way of doing things, right? 
but open also a, a deep culture in Ho Chi Minh City. And actually it's it true for most of the big cities. The reason people like to move to Ho Chi Minh City to work, to live, it's not just that they can find a good job, but also they can feel that they can be part of that big community, right? And I think the same thing, right? Go move to Manila or Bank or Jakarta, right? Or, or New York, right? They can find themselves part of the community, right? So open has been a DNA of that culture for centuries. And that's why the city thrive and grow because people are attracted by that, right? They attract by an inclusive open community, open culture. And lastly, and now we talk a lot about climate change, uh, the sea level rise that threatened the city because of it's quite in the lowland, right? Mm -hmm. And, but now we also realize that to deal with climate change, especially at the early stage, it's not about fencing off the sea whole city, which is cost a lot of money, right? And unnecessary at the, mo at the moment, right? But it's actually about being open to the landscape, to the environment, reserve more land for water and green so that they can store water, right? And minimize the flood risk a development area, right? So being open, the connection to environment, everyone can easily go to the sea, the waterfront area, everyone can easily access to a park. And that really the strategy that improving both the city sustainability, resilient, right? Against climate change, at the same time, improve the quality of living for everyone. Yeah, it, it's good you mentioned the climate change risks and, and flooding. So with what you just said, is the intention for Thudok and the whole Ho Chi Minh to have more open spaces? There's a few important strategies here uh, mm -hmm. to tackle climate change challenges in the city. Number one, that we, we highlight the importance of maintaining some of the major river corridor, right? Mm -hmm. It is really no brainer. You want to be able to discharge the the rain, the rain water from upstream downstream easily, right? And that also open up more open space and nature area in the city. So we made some mistake in the past by reclaim some of the area that's supposed for for drainage mm -hmm. uh, corridor. So now we want to protect them as the natural drainage corridor and that form a three corridor north south, including Saigon River, Dong Lai River, and there's another canal to the west of the city, become a structure into the open space for the city. The second thing that we, we do have to protect some area that already been developed, mm -hmm. right? But happen in a lowland area, right? But then if we build die to protect them and the heavy rain happen within the die area, then you need a lot more open space to hold the water. Right. So in Thu City, we propose that we can use a lot of water bodies and parks, right, as part of our stormwater management system, right? And so that we will include those parks even for the city's scale master plan, though as very small park and not being shown at that scale, but given the important in terms of controlling and maintain the retention area in the city. We show that in, 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 the, in the master plan, in the land use plan. And that helps also give a complete picture of the green network in the city as well. And then definitely there's area that is not worth uh, protect because it's low, low area, high risk, and not yet many development. Then we suggest that the, we may still allow some development, but ask them to build on pies, on columns, so that they can really so flood not an issue anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Even flood can be a benefit because it bringing the water to the area, right? And lastly is to maintain the mangrove. There's a large mangrove forest in, near the sea and that helped to protect the city from all the storm, right? From the sea. So those conservation are very critical for the benefit uh, of the city uh, when they're dealing with climate change. At the same time, really provide a very natural area that very close to everyone's neighborhood in the city. Mm -hmm. So I, I visited a while back. So I've, I've <laughs> visited twice. The last time was all the way in 2008. And I really liked it. And, and I hope to, to be back soon. And there's, you know, there's so much street life. And you could see 
tourists really enjoy themselves like yes. you know, both day and night it's always so vibrant one thing though that i recall being scared of were the motorcycles <laughs> and yes. i think it's it's a, a common you know observation of of visitors yes. is this something that's being addressed you know in the master plan or, or in other initiatives by by the government regarding maybe shifting from big use of motorbikes to public transport and walking and cycling yes well first i want to say that uh, come back anytime uh, soon <laughs> and let me know i can walk you around the city and uh, actually the the street life is really one of the unique characters of Ho Chi Minh City, especially street food, it's really good. And uh, we just actually published a book by Professor Annette Kim. The English version is Saigon Sidewalk City. And uh, we worked with her to develop a Vietnamese version and we published uh, this month. Um, to re- and uh, that's a very good study to help people understand how people there actually use a sidewalk, right? Mm-hmm. And realize that sidewalk is not just for pedestrian, but it's really a community. Is culture, is lifestyle, right? Now, and then, of course, people have concern about uh, motorbikes, especially for foreigners. For I have to say, actually, it's very safe compared to the car because motorbikes are much smaller and a lot more flexible. So actually, it's quite easy. You just could keep moving const- at the constant speed and they will avoid you, right? And even if the accident happened, it will not usually lead to s- severe injury. So actually, in terms of the accident, it's not an issue for pedestrian. It's an issue for the motorbike, the cyclist people itself. Because, of course, if you are driving a car, you are protected by a steel frame. But if you drive a motor, motorbike, you are exposed, right? Yes. So it's, that is actually the concern is the safety for the motor riders, right? Now... Definitely, the people want to change this behavior, not because of the concern about safety, but because of, I would say a few things, noise, pollution. Actually, it's polluted more in the car, and then it's a lot more noisy. And it also, seen everyone using motorbike, it's very hard to manage the traffic, right? And it's also cost traffic jam. So definitely, the city wants to encourage people to use transit. We hope to see the first metro line will be open in, I think, next year, either next year or the year after. And uh, for the Duke City, after a few engagement with the public, we all set a quite a ambitious goal to increase the right, transit mode share to, I think, 60% or 70%, which is very, very ambitious given today. Coming from, uh, sorry, go ahead. I would yeah. say coming from 10%. To 60% is, 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 of course, that's a long-term plan, so it's not going to happen overnight, right? Yeah, but basically we try to do that, but it's a matter of infrastructure, right? And for the traffic management, I would say that we start to people using more of the electric bike instead of like using gasoline, right? So it's cleaner, less noise, right? Mm-hmm. And, and maybe also try to find out how to regulate them better, especially into our parking, so that the city had more room for pedestrians, not just parking. You mentioned sidewalks. I do remember that from, from my last two visits. I recall walking, of course, I forget which street it was now, but it was a bit late at night. But you could see families that were lingering yeah. along the sidewalk, and you yes. could really see that they were very engaged with their neighbors and the people passing by. So it'd be interesting to see how that would translate to, to newer developments, you know, to, to modern mixed use developments. And I hope Ho Chi Minh retains that very active street life, even in the, the newer parts of town. Yes, actually, we have to advocate that because a lot of city officers see it as a problem, more than advantage or a unique character of the city, right? Because where the law actually happened in the sidewalk, it does reduce the capacity of the sidewalk for pedestrian. Mm-hmm. And so I think that what is great coming out of the book by Professor Annette Kim, that she proved that there's two important things. Number one, that, that the street vendors actually consume less weight on the sidewalk than the parking itself. <laughs> so the problem for the, is for the space utility is on the parking, less on the street vendors, right? The second thing is those people, those street vendors, 
they actually work together as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And even they work together at, with the shop, with the house that's right next to the sidewalk. Like for example, if someone opened a restaurant there, they will sell drinks, right? So they, they really support each other. They complement each other. And that form an ecosystem that may even contribute to, they hurt the 30% of the food supply in the city. And that affordable food supply. So that's very important for the low income groups, right? So I think the point here, is, and I think this is not applied to sidewalk in Ho Chi Minh City or any other problem of developing cities is that you need to not just see the problem, but see the benefit of the reality of how things are being organized, how things happen in our city, right? So we shouldn't take Western city as standard mm -hmm. because we are not Western people as simple as that, right? We are Asian people living in the tropical climate, right? So we have different needs, we have different culture, right? And so there's a lot of good things about our cities, whether it's Ho Chi Minh City, Manila, Bangkok, Jakarta, and how we can learn the great thing of those cities and even scale them up, right? right? Turn, turn those products into benefits, into advantage, into characters that people love, right? And truly that, as you just said, visitors love the sidewalks in Ho Chi Minh City. They love to explore food, street vendors, right? Street food, mm -hmm. right? So let's not see it as a problem, but see it as, as a benefit and then see how we can really improve the condition of it. So I've, I've, I'm actually based in Sydney now. I've been in, in Sydney for about four years, I think, four or five years. But as you know, spent most of my working years in, in the Philippines. Yes. And, you know, what you said about sidewalks, I agree with you very much so. Because, you know, some city leaders would see it as a problem. You know, sidewalk vendors are yes. taking up too much space, which should be for they say even for cars. Yes. But one of the benefits that we see as well, these sidewalk vendors are actually good stewards of space as well because they help make sure that the streets are clean, the streets are safe. And we actually have worked with some government leaders who want to copy places that do have them and do it well. Yes. I mean, as you know, you're based in, in Singapore. I've met a few clients who want to copy the hawker's market yes. model because yes. it's, you know, it, it's very unique and local. No, I think it's true. And by the way, Sydney is a city with a, a great outdoor life, right? And you see that people do a lot of things on the sidewalk cafes, of course, in a different way if you compare to Manila or Ho Chi Minh City, right? But, but that, that us, that, that human being, right? We love to be outdoor, connect to nature and connect to each other, right? So how, the question, how we can design sidewalk? to make that happen, right? And, and, and of course, there's many different kind of solutions, many different formats. And I, true that the Hawker Center is, is one successful story of Singapore. And they try to organize and, 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 and put those street vendors into a place that is easier to control and also provide amenities for them. Water supply, electricity supply, right? Mm -hmm. and, and decent place for people to sit down and eat and still enjoy the food. So I think that, that's just one example, right? How you can convert a trace of way of life into a, work, into a new format that still maintain a good character while solving the problem that they have, right? So, and also, I also love that in Singapore, every age they have a wet, uh, wet market as well, right? And why many city leaders in, in Vietnam and many other cities see wet market as a symbol of a poor developing economy, and they also think is a sewer markets or shopping mall is a good replacement, right? The truth is that we need both. We need both, right? Mm -hmm. And Singapore did that very well as well. So I think that the game, really the true answer for the problem we are dealing with is in us, in the city we live in. Don't copy and paste from somewhere else. Exactly. Find what the best solution that suit the people we serve and suit the place that we live. Right, and suit our culture, our way of living, and our climate, right? So I think this is, and, and that is why we have NCP, and that's the reason why we want to set up a company that focus on that type of solution, localized solution with local commitment, right? Because we are doing work for Vietnam because I'm Vietnamese, but we also do a lot of work in Singapore Mm -hmm. And with a team in Singapore as well, and now we start doing a lot of work for Indonesian clients, right? With an Indonesian team, 
So we bring global know-how with a local commitment and the local interest and local understanding. And I think that that's the key to deal with a lot of problems of the 21st century. I wanted to know your thoughts as well and in thinking also about Ho Chi Minh on affordable housing. So, you know, in many cities in Asia, you know, there tends to be a catch-up situation because market tends to lead development. You know, we have these private sector developers to do well and then more investors come in and then sometimes land values increase too fast. And there's more and more constraint on being able to provide affordable housing. What are your thoughts on the situation of affordable housing in Ho Chi Minh? And how, what are your plans for Tudok City? Yeah, I think that, that's a difficult question. And definitely doesn't do very well when we're talking about affordability for housing. I think we are among the least affordable when you compare housing price and the income. And I would say that the, the problem is not a market problem, but actually a legal problem. The government system, there's a law regarding affordable housing, but they, they, they very bureaucratic and they set, instead of encourage uh, or control the outcome, right? In terms of pricing, for example, or quality, they even control how the people will do that. For example, they set a maximum profit margin of 10%, and the worst one is asking that they will only recover the investment in, I think, 15 years or 10 years. So with that kind of legal requirement, no one doing it, right? Mm-hmm. For, for the investor, right? So, and, and that really unnecessary. Yeah. Government don't need to control how people do their job. Government just need to set that. No matter how, I don't care about how profit you achieve here, it's your business. But I, this is a price I set for the market here as a considered affordable. And this is a minimum quality that we require, right? That's all they need, right? Mm-hmm. But so because of that kind of policy, of course, no one doing it, right? And of course, we, when you're talking about a solution at the market scale, we have to involve private sector. And if private sector is not interested because of the, the wrong legal system, there's no one doing that. No one doing mm-hmm. that, right? So that's the situation there. Of course, it's very different government systems and markets, but you're based in Singapore. That's right. And Singapore, on the other end of the spectrum, does very well with providing housing. Are they able to do it because it's public housing? Yes. Okay, so it's all public delivery housing. So I think it, about 80% of people is uh, Singaporean living in HDB. Yes. Which stands for Housing Development, Development Board. Board. yeah. Yes. And, and Singapore can do it well, I think, because of a few reasons. Number one is it's very strong political will, right? And they see that provide a house to every family is part of the national building. It's a young nation. And they want to make sure that everyone have a stake in this country. Right. Because original is, is, is a migration country. Everyone comes from somewhere else, mostly China, right? And they may leave anytime, right? So the PAP, the, the ruling party, came up, come up with a policy that uh, if you do the national service, right, then the government is really warranty you a place in this country, a house for you. So for Singaporean today, it's very very affordable. Even they can buy a house without putting any cash, right? Because the government subsidize and also they have the CPF system. Mm-hmm. Like it's a national saving system that you have to put in every month. And you can take that money only for a few purposes like education, housing, and medical, right? So that's one thing, political will. The second thing, which is unique to Singapore, government own 80% of land in Singapore. So with that ownership, they can really, because the problem for affordability in Singapore is land price. And because they are free from expensive land price, they can really build housing and give to people at the very low cost, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the third thing you have to say that they are very good at implementation. They have a very effective and efficient system. So HDB actually control everything from design to even the, the material inventory, 
they have land in Singapore just to stop their sands and construct material so that they're not being affected by the inflections on the world market, right? Yeah. So I think th- those are a few things to that really make Singapore a successful story. But it's very difficult to replicate somewhere else. Yes. And in Ho Chi Minh, as you explained, and I hope I get understood correctly, it's both private and public, it's both private sector and government that provides for affordable housing? Mm, I would say that uh, mostly private. Mostly right? private. Which is true, government. Uh, I don't think that the government in the context of Vietnam should involve in, in building it. But they just should set the policy that anchor it, the market to support, provide affordable housing to the people. There's two, area, two main areas that we're deeply interested in. Number one is really about Asian urbanism, right? How to provide a solution that suits the context, right? So from the master plan level to even the design, building design level, right? And that involves understanding of the culture, history of the city, and the way of living and the economic condition, like how much they can afford in the city, right? So with that, we involve a variety of different projects from design the place that really separate the, the local identity to affordable housing, but by, by not just by designing, but even working on the financial model, right? To find a solution, right? So that's one area that we really focus on, finding the local solution to the local problem. The other area, especially for Singapore, is looking t- toward the future, right? Because Singapore always want to lead the world in many different aspects. And, and one area that we've been investing a lot is actually on the production. Production like of manufacturing of products or even mm-hmm. food production as well. I think this November, there will be an exhibition of the project that we worked with JTC two years ago. And we explore how the future of manufacturing look like, uh, where we can condense uh, the entire value chain of manufacturing into one place. Now, today the model is, for example, talk about iPhone, right? Apple designed the iPhone, research and design iPhone in California, and then produce it in China and now even Vietnam as well, right? And then mm-hmm. export to the rest, to the whole world, right? The two most valuable part of the value chain is in design and research and in marketing. Actually, the production part in China contribute less than 10% of the value of the iPhone, less than 10%, right? True, with the talk, we're talking about Samsung smartphone produced in Vietnam. What Vietnam earned from that may be less than just maybe 5%. But with the future, when you have the 3D printing, right? And also to expand the market, the only way for them is to customize to every local market. Is they having one product for the whole world? And so that, production from a moving from a very globalized value chain into very localized. Because actually you don't need to buy product anymore, you buy the design the product. Example, you like a shoes, but you, you can choose a, that it have string or not, you can choose a color, it's pink or black or white. And then you just order that design and they can print at home or they can print in their shop in your neighborhood. So that you get the product, like, so almost like take it a foot out of the microwave, right? So, and that process has already started in Singapore with uh, the construction of Hyundai Motor Innovation Center, where people can start to see and customize their car and see the process of car making, right? So it's, it's, it's actually, it's not a far future, but it's, it's happening. So, so we do a project where we start to integrate because of that new model of manufacturing, integrate R&D research and even marketing and production in one area, even one building, right? And, and that, that will create a new kind of urbanism, production urbanism. Same thing that we are start looking at the food production now in the urban context, because Singapore after COVID, they're concerned about food security, right? And that's still a concern happened now in Middle East as well. So we start to do a lot more local production with a goal of achieve 30% of local production by 2030, which has happened in eight years, right? So we also part of that process. And I think that also, again, as I said, create a new kind of experience. Before urbanism is about living, maybe working and experiencing uh, amenities, right? Open space. 
but in the future, even you start to see the production coming back to the city and it's even part of your experience every day. And that kind of cool, that actually our the traditional way of life, because in the past, in talking about 12 years ago, 20 years ago, right? Everything produced in your city, in your neighbor, right? You can go to a tailor in your next door and to another corner of the street, you can get your shoes, right? And that future coming back. And that also really create a new kind of very vibrant, very creative, very innovative, and very interactive urbanism that we don't experience today. If we even go back, not just to production, but the actual resource, it could yes. even help with you know lessening carbon footprint. For example, exactly. instead of extracting so much new material from other yeah. countries, you can you first look at locally, what can you recycle exactly. as, a, as a base resource. Yes. Okay, I wanted to understand as well, because you know, you're very passionate about urban planning and urbanism, and you've been such a strong advocate of creating great places in Vietnam. Of course, you're originally from Vietnam, and for many years, you know, you've been part of the planning of many places in Vietnam. You're also in the editorial board of the Vietnam Journal of Urbanism. What are positive changes that you have seen since you started your career? I think that says there's two, two changes I think I want to highlight. Number one is at the city level. People start to realize that making city for people is actually an economic development strategy. So every city now talking about pedestrian street, right? Starting in Ho Chi Minh City with Nguyen Hoi Boulevard turned into a pedestrian boulevard, right? And then Book Street, right? As a small, street that turned into being pedestrianized and have a lot of small kiosks for, for booksellers, right? And it's been, I would say, one of the most successful urban development in, in Ho Chi Minh City. Even very small scale, but it's lovely. Even people do go there to take the wedding photos, right? And all ages, all people at different ages, different background, different income, want to go there every day and to read books and to meet each other or it's just to walk around and watching people, right? So I think, and that mindset changing is, is quite critical for good urbanism, right? So they know that beside building big things like infrastructure, hospital, big office building, you need also building a lot of small things, being software, being the, building the soul for the city, right? So I think that a very positive change that's happening in Vietnam right now. The second thing, and, and it happened at a national level, that they seeing that planning being very disintegrated. Now, Vietnam, because of the heritage of socialism, we tend to believe in planning, right? And there's 10,000 plans in Vietnam. Imagine 10,000. And of course, they may not doing the same thing or even doing detecting different direction suggesting different policy that even actually against each other, right? And costing the government so much money. So I think started last year. So they approved in 2017, the Congress approved a new law for planning that required integration among all different fields from mining, agriculture, tourism, to urban development, infrastructure, right? So I think that actually is great at the strategic level that now when you do a plan at the provincial level, you need to look all different aspects and bring them in, in the plan, right? So instead of having each province have 50 plans, now have one plan that integrate everything. Of course, there's a problem behind this. It becomes too heavy, right? Too comprehensive is, that means you're losing the strategic view of the direction because you have to do with everything. But at least the idea, the understanding of being require integration in planning is, is a good thing. And also comprehensiveness is a good thing. But being too comprehensive is it not necessarily good. And I think, and that losing the strategic view for planning at the provincial level. Yeah. I've very much enjoyed speaking with you, Tung. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your valuable insights on not just Ho Chi Minh, but also Singapore and the other places where you're quite active with your work. Awesome. Pleasant is mine. And, and, and thank you again. Thank you again for having me and looking forward to more chats and more discussion with you in the future as well. Yes. And it's a lot of different topics. Yes. Let's find ways to work together as well.
Definitely, definitely. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Beyond Places. I would love to hear from you. Feel free to connect with me on social media and carmipalafox at gmail.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please do subscribe. Bye and see you again in the next episode.